<laughs> so I've got uh, I've got Kristen Weitzel here. How am I saying? Am I saying that right? Kristen. Oh my God, you got it right. No one gets it right. You Weitzel? got it right. Okay. Yeah. Well, because what do people try and be fancy and say Weitzel? Yeah, v, I don't know. What but it's even not the W. Witzel. I don't know. They make it up as they go. Do you like my? I have now, a helicopter look, pilot thing going on. Do you like it? I've noticed that it's really low EMFs. I'm very proud of you. People really talk trash about my about my headphones that I use because it's like very high EMFs and all that stuff, isn't it? So I'm probably not a very good biohacker. That's the first thing I stuff. noticed about your interviews, but it's I'm not judging you. Okay. Listen, you make up well, as long as what no you judgment, what, but what it, you gain in EMFs, you make up for in like humor and just um, lightheartedness and uh, efficacy. Well, I, wow, I appreciate that efficacy, damn. Well, I, I mean, I want to say to you also, when you pop up, the first thing I think, oh, this lady has crystals. Does she have crystals? Do you have crystals? No, I love that you think about that, that you think that about me. I do have some crystals. I have an, an altar by my doorway because I teach breath work here. So there's some crystals on it, some feathers and shit like that. But I, um, that's like a, a bit newer in my life in some way is that people always mm -hmm. sort of recognize me as like a science-y chick. Being into okay, the science cool. of things, yeah, well, like I'm like practical. Tell me, show me the research, and then I'll put the crystal on top of it. Yeah, but got yeah, it. I, I think your appearance is different like, to your voice. It your is? appearance is different to your voice. Your voice is quite commanding and um, um, Alpha, realistic. Right. Whereas your yeah, it's it well kind of. And then your appearance, you could be a hippy dippy type of person, but I don't I don't get that from you. Considering that we met at the biohacking conference when you were about to give a talk. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, yeah, I think your appearance does not quite match up with whom you are. I love that. You got to keep them guessing. <laughs> exactly. Let me introduce you and, uh, we'll get right into it. Okay. Kristen Weitzel, founder of Sherpa Breath and Cold and Warrior Woman Mode, is a renowned women's health expert who has been featured on stages around the world. She is a health and high performance maven, nutrition specialist, certified fitness trainer, master breathwork and deliberate cold exposure coach. With a focus on building stronger, healthier bodies for her clients, Kristen also hosts the Well Power podcast, expanding biohacking with an even broader audience, including ways females can align with their hormones and life cycles, and just how far we can all go in pursuit of optimal performance. As a progressive voice, dynamic leader, and active biohacking proponent, she questions how far the human body can go and helps people take it there. Kristen, good day. Good day. That's so good. It's almost as if I wrote it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, in fact, you did. I mean, I, I just you, usually take people's uh, words that they write for themselves and put it in the bio, but I thought it, it summed up what you what you are perfectly. And I want to ask you, we met the other day at the biohacking conference. Um, you came up to me because you like my videos and I was, I was blushing and you were about to go and give a talk um, in front of a bunch of people. I couldn't make it. I had to go to Vegas, but you um, were giving a talk. What did you give a talk on? I gave a talk on deliberate cold exposure. I said, expose yourself to the thrill of the chill. Trying to infuse some humor <laughs> into that conference. It's, it's a good thing, you know? Like that. And I do want to say yeah, that Yeah, there's I, um, not, a lot of, not a lot of humor there. Yeah. I mean, you know, people are working on it. Uh, I, I, it was so great to see you there. It's like sort of a highlight of the conference for me, whether that sounds dorky or not. I don't care. Oh, um, because I think you. there's this moment that we see people that we feel like we know and I had the luxury of actually tr training a session with you in West Hollywood at some point. And, um, oh, sick. yeah. So I was like, this is so great. Like I've had a personal moment before all of, uh, the cascade of humorous things on your <laughs> Instagram handle. And, um, just like I followed your journey for so long and it feels yeah. like in the weird way that it does with social, like I feels like, Oh, I know this guy. And I know, you know, you share a lot about your life. Um, and your wigs yes. and your music and all the things, but you kept a lot of people, I think, really positive spirited over the course of quarantine. So it was well, rad so to much. see when you're tall, you, you're like, I forget how tall you are. I'm lanky. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, and some, many people may not know this, but I used to be a trainer at a place called Training Mate in West Hollywood and Santa Monica. They had a couple of locations and, um, I must have taught Kristen there. I don't remember you, but, um, I was, it was such a pleasure to meet you and then get to talk to you immediately because my immediate question to you was about cold exposure for women in particular. Um, one of our friends, mine and Kara's friends has been talking about is cold exposure good for women or not? And I imagine that it has to be 
it, it has to be different between men and women. Um, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it is. It's definitely different for men and women, males or females. Like we have to say that in this day and age, right? It's like when sure, we talk sure. about men and women, we're talking about physiological females at birth or physiological males. Everyone can do it any way they want in between. It's totally great. But um, mm -hmm. when it comes to cold exposure, I'm, I'm just looking at the research, which we have to kind of say the thing, which is the research is very widespread and all over the map at the same time. So we have a decent amount but we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have a ton of research about women. That sort of holds true in many cases, a lot of research, but especially when it comes to cold and then cold is all over the place, as you can imagine, it's like ice cubes or a river or a stream or your left arm only into shower. the cold. Yeah. Shower, mm. cryo. There's not a lot on cryo, but um, what we see with women, I think is, and I'm a bit conservative in that way is like uh, around cold exposure. <laughs> that is anyway, that the longer, you know, this, this going in every day, go hard philosophy just doesn't really quite fit the mold of the female physiology. And especially with women who are showing up with hormone dysregulation or other issues. Um, it's like, you don't need to go in every day, right? You're going to do it. You want, if mm -hmm. you're a diehard fan and you want to go three, four times a week, awesome, but give your body some pause in between. Whereas the male physiology seems to tolerate it a bit better, just like fasting. It's a similar thing with fasting. I'm a little bit more yep. conservative on women fasting than men and uh and that's that's interesting to me you know it's like uh we also men more or less it's a little bit uh, even when they are um, ice plunging daytime versus nighttime women were a bit it's a bit easier for us in the daytime than the evening so mm -hmm. you know that's like again i'm sweeping generalizations but this is like what we what we look at so yeah yeah. So, but I mean, you know, like, let's just say that me, that me and Kara are going to cold plunge and she'll try to th be thinking, oh, I'll do it for five minutes. Just like Luke, she should be maybe thinking, just do it, f do it less often and do it for less long. Would that be something that's, uh, would be correct to tell her? Yeah. I, in some ways. Yeah. I think less, less frequently, the frequency over the course of a week could be less than you and mm -hmm. less long is like a really, um, like any good question when it comes to like science or biohacking or in bio individual health shit, it's like, okay, it depends. <laughs> it depends on, you yep. know, uh, like that's contraindications, right? If someone were to be like pregnant and they never ice plunged before, it's like probably like time to skip that and, you know, wait till that process is over and, or just like at least the first trimester, right? Again, like go to your medical doctor, but any woman who's not mm -hmm. carrying a child, it's like, what is your minimum effective dose? Right? This is a question I have for, for you as a man as well. It's like, what's your minimum effective dose? How do we figure out what is good for us individually or in a female physiology? Like what makes the most sense? If, for example, women that come to me a lot and they're like, hey, we're going to do this great breathwork session and everyone else is going to go in the cold, but I'm not doing it because I have my period. And I sometimes like to just invite that female to explore if it's like, uh, I'm nervous about the cold and I have never done it before. And maybe this is my out or if it's mm -hmm. just, um, you know, something that they're really feeling intuitively, they're in a lot of pain or something else is going on because it is a time when we have a lower, it's like our lower hormone profile. It's not that we are like men, but we, we are closer directionally. So we have low mm -hmm. estrogen, low progesterone in that moment. And it's kind of a great time to go in. And so, um, Interesting. you know, there's like lots of different philosophies around that. If you look at Ayurvedic culture or things like that, they might say no cold, no cold, but I'm a super fan. So <laughs> super fan that I yeah. am. Maybe the best, the best way to go about this is, you know, if we're, we're sweeping generalizations, let's talk about you. Let's talk about how you do it. How do you tend to cold plunge? How long do you tend to do it? How many times a week? And especially depending on your, you know, cycle, do you yeah. not do it certain days, certain times of the cycle? I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I'm a super nerd about cold. I love it. Like I just love it. And so the first thing everyone who's listening should know is like, you can fall in love with it as much as I have. And I'm not only teaching it in community sessions and around the world now and to universities and, um, running an instructor training, Sherpa breath and cold instructor training, you know, I'm a super fan. And so if you fall in love with it, you get to do it as much as you want in many ways. 
And there's a level of like dedication to that, right? So like I'll do like in and out Mm -hmm. plunges over six minutes where I'm like submerging myself for 10 seconds minimum on the in and the out. And to me, that's fun. There's like some play in there. There's some essence of femininity and play. And, you know, I have a a very big side of me that maybe my vocal tonality you said or whatever earlier is like, it's the more alpha side of me. And that, that I love to balance all of that in the cold. I think for, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the earlier days, I probably plunged less. So I'm always plunging. Let's talk about temperature first. I'm always plunging sub 40, sub 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius, four degrees, something like that. It's like full. Because I want it to be cold. I want minimum effective dose. And what that kind of means to me and to the general population is what gives you a bit of a shiver response after you've gotten out? Maybe a little bit of a shiver starting when you're, you know, just coming to the end of it in the cold, but after you've gotten out. And so um, sub 40 to me is, a, again, the, the literature, the, the research is all over the place. But what we do see is we activate cold shock proteins under 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And forgetting all the nerdy science, the better a cold, a, a cold shock protein it, it folds, the better your cells can communicate with each other, which is important when you're talking about you know, upregulating your cellular health and everything communicating so that you can get this cascade of benefits from cold. So we want to activate the cold jock protein. And so that's why I try to plunge myself Mm -hmm. and other people under 40, under 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then time is like the thing, right? Time is the jam. This is like Joe Rogan gets in the ice plunge and he's like 22 minutes and whatever happens. You know, what really happens there though, of course, you know, which is he does one, we know, cause we see it on Instagram, 4 million followers, whatever, mm-hmm. one minute, he does a minute or so in his forge in his yard. And then he gets out cause it's cold, right? Like that's the natural body's response. Yo, this is cold. That was a minute. I'm out. And then Jocko and uh, Goggins and everyone are like, dude, you suck. What do you get? MMA, whatever. You're not a tough ass. Like get in the... And then two days later, he does 21 and a half minutes or something, I think, until he's like convulsing. <laughs> and, and that's cool, yeah. like in some way, right? In some way, it's like, uh, uh, it's like the competitive thing. But mostly, I get nervous that like 4 million people watch that. And I think it scares a lot of people off because it looks scary yeah. at the end. And it is kind of, he's like, he's no longer minimum effective dose. He's like point of diminishing returns. Also... Call me up, Rogan, and I'll, you know, challenge you in an ice bath. It still would be fun. And it's still like, you know, I'm not trying to knock on him. I love the yeah. work he's doing in the world. But, me too. you know, it's like there's a happy medium <laughs> somewhere in there. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I plunge at like six minutes. Sometimes I'll plunge 10. Yeah. And context is not talked about a lot. Like, I know that you train. I know that you train, Luke. And so sometimes I potentiate a workout with an ice bath before I go and lift heavy shit. And that's, yeah. I find, I really like it. But if I stay in 10 minutes before I get on a, either like a heavy machine or under heavy weights, I'm either shivering too much or it's a little dangerous. Like the belly of the muscle is too cold to actually potentiate and do the work. Or like get the force. Yeah. And so then you're just screwing yourself, you know? So it's like, how do you, where are you going after? What are you doing before? But for me, it's like sub 40, six minutes. I love a six minute. And I, I get because I plunge three to four times a week, I have, I'm blessed to have a, a, plun, uh, a I have a Morosco forge in my backyard. I get a chance to kind of do it as often as I want and I can play, you know, I can do in and outs and I can do head unders and all those things like dipping and it's all fun. And it's all, you know, the way that we titrate a minimum effective dose over time. Cause you adapt, you know, this cause you're cold plunging. I am. Yeah. I, uh, I feel like you're going to, um, emasculate me. I don't, I don't go for very long. I do it every day, every morning. Uh, and I do it for two minutes, two to three minutes. And I, I, it's just because I was dreading it so much. I wanted to do it first thing in the morning. And I was mm-hmm. like, and I was going up to five minutes. And I was like, I just hate this. Like, I really hate it. And I really hate like having to get in and guilting myself and shaming myself. I'm like, I just want to get in for two and I'm and make it tolerable and enjoyable for myself. So that every time I get out, I'm like, Oh, thank goodness. I'm out of that. I'm totally shivering yeah. and like freezing as anything, dunking my head under the whole time. And I'm like, I just want to enjoy it, you know, and I want to get mm-hmm. the health benefits. And I feel like I do. You can tell me if I'm not, but I think two minutes per day, first thing in the morning, I think I'm, I think it's great. <laughs> and I, no, I, I feel amazing. <laughs> and I love what it does. 
Bob, yeah, I don't, I'm not, know, here, to, I'm not here to emasculate you. Let me be clear. I also think <laughs> here, this is what's so cool about um, bio-individuality, but also like you're a dude and you guys, men, will have like a different, you have a different hormonal cycle and you're like 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. to 12 a.m., right? You're having a rise in testosterone at some point there. And it's a great time for you mm-hmm. to cold plunge. It's a great time for you to lift weights and really get after it. Like, you know, in the words of Jocko Willink, he's like, time to get after it. And that's beautiful for you. And then also you, I'm sure that you could do this thing, which is like muscle through five minutes and be like, okay, I'm super shivering and I'm a badass. And like, you know, all the other things you do in the world, make it so that you can do that. And you've made this really beautiful choice for yourself. It's like balance of masculine and feminine. And you saying, I'm powerful. I'm a badass guy. And I have some sensitivity to know that I want to make this an enjoyable practice that I can adhere to so that over the long haul, I can get health benefits. So in my mind, that doesn't make you a wuss. That makes you smart and efficient and effective and not over adapting yourself because people can over adapt to cold. And then we're not getting that dose of stress that we need because none of us get in the ice bath to get good at ice bathing, ice bathing. We get in here to get good at life, to get good at managing stress. And that's what, that's, what's badass about cold, right? It's like if someone wants to start mm. with cold showers or cryo or whatever, like just do it. I mean, there's more benefits in emerging immers, immersion, deliberate cold exposure where you're like in the tub, but start yeah. where you're at. Yeah. And let's talk about that a bit more. The, you know, the ability to grow resilient from doing this. Um, what can you tell me about that? What, what is, what can it do? What, what else, what are the other health benefits of getting into cold other than the cold shock proteins, which you mentioned, which are great. What else? Yeah. Like the, the big ones that aren't so science nerdy are, you know, sleep is a really big thing. I think Jim quick has a, has a practice. I think it's cry. He does cryo more than cold, um, mm-hmm. immersion, but cryo, it can be amazing. Water, a cold water immersion, cold showers, even you'll see like help with your sleep sleep scores. If you're nerding out, like I wear an aura ring, especially when it comes to like immersion, I will get like an hour more of deep sleep on the the days that I ice plunge. And that to me is like, that's our like baseline. That's a, that's the thing that helps. We are only as fit as what we can recover from. And so that's all recovery all the time, every minute we're sleeping. And Mm -hmm. that's a big one. Uh, Mood boosting. That's amazing by the way. an hour is of more of deep sleep, by the way, for anyone listening, is a very large amount. I think I average oh, yeah. two hours of deep sleep a night. So if you're getting an extra hour and what happens in the brain and the clearing out of, you know, whatever's cleared out um, in deep sleep, it's so restorative. So to get an extra hour is like incredible. Yeah. And I mean, women, generally speaking, you know, if you look at the research, it talks about a lot about women being way more susceptible to stress and anxiety and rumination. And I have a lot of that, like, trying to like laying down at night and then just like my thoughts are racing doesn't mean men don't have that it just means like I have a lot of like rumination and like 42 emotions and think replaying scenarios and looping and things that I'm trying to yes. work on in my own or I'm working on in my own my own journey and so the cold just mm-hmm. sort of you know like what a surf nap you know what I mean like if you're in the ocean and you're swimming and then like you come in and you're just like you fall asleep without even knowing like on the couch for 15 minutes it's like the best nap ever There's Mm -hmm. a piece of that vibe that comes from post cold plunge that I really love at night. It's like, I don't cold plunge. I do cold plunge in the morning sometimes, but if I'm choosing the time, it always feels like this. It's like sunset ish, but there's still light in the sky. I cold plunge. I get real dang hungry in the next hour. I like make a lovely dinner. And then I like unwind. I turn off all my blue light and all my things. I put on my dorky blue light blocking glasses or you know, my Mm -hmm. Viva rays or whatever I'm using. And then I unwind into the night and I like chill and then I go to bed and that's when sleep comes on in such a good way. And so, yeah, an hour for me, it's like doubling a lot of my deep sleep. Like I can get like two and a half hours of deep sleep and that's baller. That's just like, I feel real good (laughs) the next morning when I get up and in the morning I, Mm. I can still do it and get energy and get all the things and get a decent extra, um, you know, like REM or deep sleep, but, but, but I love that little like window of time when the sun is setting for me, it just feels good. Yeah. Uh, You are going to go on from um, um, sleep uh, with stress as well. Yeah. So stress inoculation would be like the nerdy team, the the nerdy term stress inoculation, (laughs) just meaning like we're building resiliency 
right? So like if we sit around and we like wait for like the divorce to happen or the trauma to happen or the, the shit to hit the fan in our, in our lives, then, then what are we kind of doing? We're like not exploring a growth mindset and we're not building resiliency. And part of the reason ice is great for understanding stress is twofold. Part one is we're having to work with our breath, which means working with our nervous system to learn how to stay calm under pressure. And part two is really like we're training ourselves for the shit to hit the fan, right? Nobody stands next to it. Nobody, including me, stands next to an ice bath and is like, that looks like warm, like bring on the pina coladas. I'm just going to like easily cascade into that freezing cold water. No one does that. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. how do we like stand next to it, not over anticipate it, lean into it, do the damn thing and then get out and and, and understand how we respond to stress. Like this is going to sound like a little woo, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is what I love about cold exposure on the ice bath. And it's like why I want to like sit next to you when you're in an ice tub for three minutes or anyone. It's like why I do this work is because I can see a person's like lifespan or like how they act under stress or how they were as a little kid in stress or anything that might have been traumatic to them. You can see that in this like three minute, let's say two to three minute microcosm of the cold because people will look at me. Sometimes there's like total disarmament You that, that no, no, you know, um, like they're vulnerable enough and they don't, you can't really keep your shit together in cold because it's mm-hmm. so intense. And so people can be calm, people can be stoic, but you can see how they handle stress in life in general in three minutes in the cold. And then as you train and work with people or people to work with their breath and work with their stress, they just get better at it across the board. And it's so rad to see that. And it's so like we talking about women Women going into cold and not realizing their own capacity, no capacity I ever gave them. They showed up on this planet with like that strength, that demeanor, that character, that capacity to do hard things. And when women re-realize that, it's so, it's Mm -hmm. just badass. Like I see their careers take off. I see them get healthier. I see them like leave the shitty job or break off the relationship or whatever they've been waiting to do, or like step into the relationship in a way that's even bigger and better. And that that's the, that's the benefit I do talk about a lot because it's not in the paperwork so much. It's not in the research. Yeah. It's like people's mm. mindsets and people understanding their abilities and their confidence that comes out that, that mental toughness that comes from getting in the cold is it's to me, it's like the biggest benefit. Yeah. I don't think that that's woo woo at all. I think that that's, I think that that's, you know, a scientific paper can't tell us whether this is true or not because it is because we just know it to be true as people that we, when you willingly put yourself through some pain, like exercise or getting into a cold plunge or, um, you know, uh, getting into a sauna that you're, you're actively taking on the burden of being and carrying something and lifting something heavier than you, you thought you ever could. And what that does for the brain and what it does for you in moments of stress, when you're like, I I don't know if I can get through this. You can get through this. You've willingly taken on, more than you could carry before. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's nothing but good. Those are my, my favorite type of people are the people who willingly bear the burden of being, they take on hard things and they're always going to be people who can, who are going to be there for you in a crisis and who are going to be people that you can rely on. And are you going to be that person or you person who a person who's always taking the comfortable way out? You know, I, I willingly put myself through pain and I like when my son sees me work out or get in the cold plunge and I'm like, Ooh, and, he, and, he, and I like him. See, I like when he sees me do it. Cause it's like, this is life. Isn't just sitting around on a couch all day. Like, like, it's like, take it on, like it, make it tough. It's better when it is. Yeah. Full on. I just, I was drinking coffee an hour and a half ago in this now empty cup that my client gave me that says your comfort zone will kill you. And it's like mm-hmm. really this new, like this just like, it's so visceral for me when I read that. I'm like, yeah, the comfort zone will kill me. Mm-hmm. I need to like stretch. And I have, that's so cool to be able to do that in, in different areas of our life. And then also to raise kids in that world so that they feel like that's a, there's a different um, energy with which they approach it. Yeah. And we know so much about this now. I mean, like the, like, I think it's called horm- hormesis, the act of fasting, mm-hmm. saunas, cold plunge is uh like it's a a stress that you put especially when you put it upon yourself you don't do it out of like you don't fall off the titanic into freezing cold water you're actively getting into a cold plunge 
that this is like yeah. the new thing that people are talking about, actively putting yourself through, through, through such stresses and yeah, intentional you know, stress. Yeah. yeah. Intentional stress. And it makes you better yeah, when you are actually under you stress. The $10 word in the middle of this. You're like, here's the $10 Fancy. word, hormesis. It's great. Let's educate. Me. What else Fancy. can we do for hormesis? <laughs> Yeah. Well, but let's talk a little bit about um, particularly um, women and hormesis. Um, what about, mm -hmm. you mentioned fasting before. Can you clarify that for me? I intermittent fast. I do about uh, 16 hours of fasting a day. So, you know, starting at night all the way through to middle of the day and the next day. What about for, what do you do for fasting? So I will um, alternate days of fasting and I never run a 16, eight window. Um, I, mm -hmm. most of my life have had a pretty normal hormonal cycle. Uh, it's a little wonky right now. So I'm extra cautious. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm conservative on fasting for women. I think like, look, can you rock a 24 hour fast, 36 hour fast? If you're specifically doing something that's for that. Sure doesn't mean don't do any of this. It's like absolutist thinking will crush us all. But generally speaking, it's like every other day or a 14 hour window or even a 12 hour window, I think can be fine for women. There's lots of different ways to sort of play it. And if you're doing a 16, eight as a woman, I think the next day that you, maybe you skip that. Maybe you just have a regular eating cycle and you're not pushing so hard. I think 16, eight works really well for men. Um, that's we we've seen that, and for some women it can be dysregulating. So the other thing that comes up with women that is so important, and I'm sure that you have some familiarity with this, is like the training cycle and the time of month. So you asked earlier when is a bad time to get in to the cold or under any kind of hormesis, and for me the hardest time, and for most women the hardest time of the month and our monthly cycle is like that five to seven days leading up to the period. Right. So we're in this luteal phase. It's the last week of the cycle. And we're just feeling like we want to turn inward. We're way more sensitive to cold. Our uh, ability to uptake carbon dioxide or oxygen into the body is less. And so we're sort of like playing in that space where, where um, things are happening to us that are going to uh, elicit like PMS symptoms. Right. We feel more less tolerant of pain. We have more sensitivity. And so colds can really be like, whoa, or women who are dealing with autoimmune conditions and Hashimoto's just so cold sensitive. So it's like, maybe they're, maybe they're not fasting as much. Maybe they're not sort of the worst time to fast and the mm -hmm. hardest time to get in the cold. So maybe it's time to be, you want to do it, but you're just even more conservative then. And so it's like following along with that cycle in our monthly window, you know, so my, my girlfriend, Kayla, who studies this for a living says we're four different people every month. And I said, hell with that. I'm like 28 different people <laughs> during the course of the month. So how do we feel into that and say, you know, what makes, what makes the most sense? And you, um, you know, we see, I see this in nutrition though, too, right? This is a slippery slope because women will come to me after a week of like perfect eating and then being like, I had this intuition that I just like, I needed the pizza and the Ben and Jerry's, you know, I just need, it was intuitive eating. And it's like, at that point, actually, that's not what's going on. Um, so for working with our cycle, it's really important working with our intuition and also having some autonomy for um, personal responsibility for the things that we've chosen to do. And then being credible with those, those choices uh, is a thing. And then so the last thing I do want to say about strength training, which is, an, or I want to say about including strength training in this mix is if any woman is listening to this right now and not working eventually to train in alignment with their cycles every month, then I want them to start looking into that and doing that because there are, when you look at the research since the eighties, it's been around, it took far too long to get into my hands and women are doing this more now where they are training with their estrogen rise and spike in the body, because we can make more muscle at that time of the month, which is about, let's say seven, a week or so of the month than any other time. And it's like, Luke, if you knew that as a man, you could train seven days in a month and build more muscle than any other time of the month, you'd like, there would be like the Luke cook seven days to muscle madness program sold at midnight on television, you know, uh, networks. <laughs> It's like, it would be out yeah. there and, and we just haven't been talking about it enough as women and training with the cycle and this periodization, no pun intended, not nothing to do with period. But when we're building mm -hmm. fitness programming for women, we're like building this fitness programming, like it'll just work the same, like the same way we do 
with men. It doesn't mean it won't work. It's just not optimal for women. So how do we align what we're doing when, with our training cycle, our periodization with our estrogen rise in the body if we're in, in, in our reproductive years? Right. So the higher the estrogen, the easier that a person will, uh, a woman will be able to, a female will be able to build muscle. So that'll be around then the, what phase is that where estrogen is highest? So first couple of weeks, so our, after when we have our period, when we, we're ending our period, the, it's different for every woman, right? Three to five days, something like that. So at the end of our mm -hmm. menstrual cycle, we are hitting a buildup of estrogen. So I typically say like, I say day six to 16, I recognize that that's 10 days, but like, it's basically just at the end of the period till right around the time of ovulation. And so it's like some women, it's six, six days, some women, it's nine days. It's so sort of like, and, and if mm -hmm. we're not blood testing, we don't exactly know. So I call this, when I work with one-on-one -on -one clients, I call this maximum, maximum effort week or like go hard week, because I say least amount of rest days, most amount of really important here, slow, steady strong. It's like not a time to do explosive movement. We have more joint laxity then. So it's like, mm -hmm. pick up the heaviest shit you can safely and for like a moderate amount of reps. So if this is not a time we're trying to do like 15 to 25 reps of anything, just like slow, steady, strong. And that's mm -hmm. a time where we're creating more a capacity for the body to, I guess, estrogen, estrogen, I love it, is, um, it's anti-catabolic, right? So it is, it's preventing muscle breakdown and it's helping our muscles grow, then build faster than any other time of the month. And at the same time, we can eat more carbohydrates because we uptake carbs better during that week. So what better time to not do yeah. the dance of like a few more carbs and a few more heavy weights? Yeah, love that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you mentioned, <laughs> I can feel a lot of women hearing, oh, I build muscle easier at this time, them going, ah, oh, I don't want to build muscle. Like, I don't want to be muscular. And, and, and I hear a lot, I hear a lot of women talk about that. And culturally, that shifted. It wasn't this like 10 years ago, there weren't as many women in the weights room as there are now, which is mm. a great thing that there, there has to be, how do you encourage women um, kind of away from the, I want to be skinny to the, you know, muscles good for you. It's good to have muscle. Yeah. I think it's a re-education. It's like a thing I was on. I'm still on a soapbox about is this like, and I, I lived in LA for a, quite a long time and, and worked with a lot of women who were like, but I'm, I'm just eating like four lettuce leaves and a rice cracker and I'm doing all the things right. Uh -huh. And I'm doing 4,000 spin classes a week. And all of that. It's not to say those things are not healthy in some way. They should be built into your fitness variants. But from any you know young age where you have some safety and, and biomechanical understanding till 80, 90, 100 years old, whatever, heavy, heavy is relative. So whatever's heavy for you, we want to be lifting those weights because longevity, because bone density, because lung capacity, because muscularity helps build us into a place where we can, like, do you want to be 90 and not be able to get out of a chair? Or do you want to be able to be like gardening and playing with your grandkids or whatever the things are you want to do to be active and mm -hmm. mobile enough? And so muscle is really important in that scenario, as well as there's this like weird fallacy about, I want to lose weight, which is like not a thing. And it doesn't, it just means nothing losing weight. Cause if you lose muscle, you're just like muscle wasting. It's like, no, not good for your body and mm -hmm. losing weight. That's body fat is a bit more optimal. So we really want to try to lose fat. Most of us, some people need to put on muscle. They're already pretty lean, but like losing fat doesn't sound sexy or maybe it does, or then it maybe it sounds shameful. So there's a lot of that shit with women in the world. So it's like, okay, I'll lose body fat. So I always talk about it, like losing body fat or even more. So I will say recompositioning the body. But what women, every woman who's listening to this right now and every man that has a woman in their life spread the word because what happens is we build more muscle when we have more muscle on our body we burn more calories at rest right and this 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 conversation around i'm only going to build lean muscle is not real we build muscle it's like only lean like what is that like a, this specific movement mm -hmm. gives you this specific lean muscle muscle is the very best mm -hmm. thing we can do for our bodies to recomposition and if you look at people like Brett Contreras, who's working out with like 90% females and shape shifting, these women are like, they're just like squatting 250 pounds. They're just, in, they're insanely strong 
And none of them are Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger looking, you know, none of them are like huge mm -hmm. diesel. Some of them are like in competitions. And so they're like quite, quite strong, quite shapely, quite muscular, but you, you mm -hmm. have to like eat four chicken breasts an hour and work out two hours a day with all these heavy weights to get in that shape or that form where women are saying, I don't want to get big. Like we got to get off the, I don't want to get big train. It is extremely hard to get big as a woman. And, you know, I want to challenge any woman to be like, I'm going to see if I can get too big and see what happens. Like your waist will get smaller. Your body will get more chiseled. You look the way that I think a lot of women want to look, which is including lean, including thin. Oh, I hate to use that term, but like, it's just a, uh, I don't know. We don't have dudes doing this. Generally speaking, we don't have men saying, I just want to get smaller. This is the soapbox I'm on is that women are always like, I want to get smaller. And for crying out loud, can we stop trying to get smaller? Because that, that actual energetic thing of getting smaller means we talk less. We share our opinions less. We're just like trying to crouch mm -hmm. off into a corner and fade away with our like lettuce and rice crackers. And it's just shitty for the entire planet. If you don't mm. mind me saying so frankly, um, no, and also, good. I just thank need a sidebar that thank you so much for having that interview with Africa on your podcast, because it really was amazing for me to even listen to it as a coach, to recognize that there are times that I am not speaking my full opinion, because I'm worried about what people mm. will think. And it gave me really good pause to remember, like, I'm going to say the things that I really believe. And if someone calls me out doing something wrong, I'm so open to that opinion and having a growth mindset. But enough of the hiding yeah enough of the hiding i agree i i uh, i encourage i mean i love the message that you just put forward i think that's a really important one maybe see how big you can get see how heavy you can lift see how like you know see, see up your protein Everyone see what happens be doing six like, minutes in the ice bath and twice as much weight as luke can lift and then <laughs> luke will feel uh, you know, sure a little and he'll make some <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I'll be wanting to get smaller at that point. Um, I, mm. yeah, I think that's, I do think that it's a really positive uh, um, message to put out there. The, that what is the idea that people want to get smaller, you know, mm. in, in inverted commas? Like, what, what, is, what does that mean? And, and, and when we say that to ourselves, when we say that to people, I want to get smaller, I want to get smaller. It's like, do you want to, like, the power of words is, it's not just like, you're not just talking about your physical form here. Like it can, it can go out there. Like you were saying, like you start s s speaking loud, like you quieter and you don't ask for what you want. You don't go for what you want. You know, you don't go to the boss for, you know, a raise. And totally. I think we have to be considerate of that. Totally. Yeah. It, it blends into everything else that you're doing, the shrinking. And so, Yeah. Asking for what we want. All of us should be doing that. And I, you know, I work with so many women and I see us shying away from that. And, and I see a lot of shame in the, in the category around all of these health and wellness practices. And especially when it comes to body image. So, um, yeah, it's a really important point. And if you get yeah, in the ice more, is, you'll definitely no. be like, I am not small. I am huge. I am, I have so much capacity. I can take on the world, you know, it's a little thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. So you're a breath coach. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, that piece is really interconnected in a way that is vitally important to doing cold plunging as well, which is understanding how we breathe correlates to our nervous system state and how we, ha how we handle stress across the board. So I'm mm -hmm. always teaching a little breath before people get into cold. And I love to teach people how to utilize their breath to recover doesn't mean that you can't play with all the breath variables and also, you know, super ventilator. A lot of what we're seeing online and social is like um, celebrity breath workers and people that are having, you know, creating spaces and situations and containers where those of us can get out there and breathe in bigger ways, more extroverted ways, louder, you know, very um, dramatic ways, let's say, and create uh, a physical situation where we are, we are, our default mode network drops away and we can process trauma and emotionality and all that. And that's super cool. Also, we don't want to be like doing that 90% of our day. We want to do that in, in isolated and well-practiced, you know, with well-practiced practitioners. And then we want to be able to integrate what we're learning in those moments. And so there's breath is really, it's it, everyone's like, cool. I'm breathing every day. 
I already know how to do it. And also there's just a really beautiful thing about the way you can manipulate the breath or practice the breath to be able to figure out and get more, a better understanding of your nervous system so that you can contextually like heal yourself or move through emotional states or get your mindset right so that you're not holding on to anger and really like forgive, forgive yourself or the things that have happened to you that have been challenging and not hold on to that story. And it sounds like Kristen breath is going to do that. Breath is going to change my entire mindset on something that's like, okay. But the mm -hmm. reality is like your breath is the remote control to your nervous system. So, you know, chicken or egg, you know, we can figure things out just by sure shifting it yeah yeah sure and so that's like what you're essentially talking about is like let's just say um uh, something triggers me from a, you know and brings up a traumatic event that makes me angry being aware of my breath is a way to calm my nervous system down or come into control of my nervous system or to like build a, a greater awareness around the emotional connection to the physiological yeah and like connecting to pe other people co-regulating like if you lay next to your partner in bed at night and you're, you're breathing with them and you, you co-regulate your breath, you'll start to co-regulate your heart rate, your heartbeat. Like this is why, you know, using, utilizing breath work and getting really good at it is also like great to increase the, you know, efficacy or like the excitement of your sex life and of things that are happening in the world. Like we just, we get to connect with each other better through breath and why not, figure that out and and why not when you're going to fly off the handle and you're just going to shoot your cortisol through the roof or whatever's going to happen why not in the, in between the stimulus of whatever's coming in and you know your response why not be like how can i just hold on for a minute or two and like figure out how i'm breathing in this moment to maybe shift my state into a place of mm. You know, whatever, love, connection, community, like what's at the end of the day, this person who's pissing me off wants a certain thing and I want a certain thing. And I bet if we both calm down, we could realize that what we want is similar. It may not be the same outcome, but it's like, I want connection or I want solution or I want um, to be included or whatever, right? Whatever the thing is. And so breath is really a gateway to getting more connection with people. And so I think it's like, it's, it's essential, you know, like whether it's cold or managing stress or whatever, I think it's essential for us to get to know ourselves in some kind of place that makes us a bit more aware of who we are. And I can say like wholeheartedly that I had as a, as a late teenager, early twenties, I had a lot of anger, a lot of anger. And I would do a lot of this, like my ex used to be like, it's like you come home from work and you're like fight with your firing into the like into the sky or whatever from work and you just walk in the door and you're still like shooting the gun. And then the, I'm in the way of it now, you know, and it's like, it's like, <laughs> how do I, like, it's not very nice to the person that I love the most in the world to, to have that going on. Yes. And it was a lot of breath work and a lot of meditation specifically for de-stressing, but also breath work because it like, I could learn how to calm my state in sitting in meditation and realizing that I think it like almost naturally just happened that I, I figured out how to calm myself down or to be managing that stress better and treating people better, you know? And so it made me, uh, you know, it's like, I, I wanted to be a better person for that. And like, it helped me figure that out when like therapy or anything else I was doing was just not quite getting me there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love to take my mind to my breath. I'm a big fan of, um, kind of uh, breathing out longer than I breathe in. Uh, this is something that me over the last few weeks in particular, me and my wife have been doing a hypnobirthing course because mm. uh, Cara's due in November. So we've been doing that together. And so at night we're trying, as soon as Chaplin goes to bed, we sit down together and we do 10 minutes of focused, like there's a mantra involved, but a lot of it is breathing out for longer than we breathe in an awareness of that and letting go of all the tension in our, around our jaw and our shoulders and our chest. Um, mm. but I want to know your secrets because you just said, okay, so it helps, you know, your awareness of, um, and it helps with uh, m helping you with stressful situations or angry situations, sex. Tell me how. <laughs> Tell you how, you just want to know the sex part. You want to, you're like, we're ready. Yeah, we're going to exactly. make it. Another... Let's get, <laughs> well, I did want to ask you about sex cause you're a biohacker. So you got like, it's got, it's a huge part of life. Um, it is yeah. life really. Uh, so yeah, yeah let's, uh, can we talk about breathing and sex? 
This is fine. Yeah, we can talk about breathing and sex for sure. I think it's like also like a healthy sex life. And I don't even mean, look, you can have nine partners at once or uh, separately, or you can be with yourself, whatever. I think having a healthy mm -hmm. sex life and a healthy sex drive sort of speaks to what your hormones are doing and also um, how your mental health is. You know, it's like you feel maybe it's a less lonely thing, or maybe it's more, it's mostly, it's more connected either to your own body, your own breath, your own partner or partners. And that to me is like, if everybody was having a lot more sex, then we'd have a lot less argument and a lot less war and a lot less strife and a lot less drama in the world for sure. And so for me, I am always, I'm so pro exploration and people being sex positive and really like leaning into their sex life. I think when you tell me this story about you and Kara being like, Hey, I'm going to, we're going to do this breath work at night and all of this. I just think my immediate thought is how wonderful to be able to have that in a couple, how amazing that is for not only the baby on its way, but the child that you already have to see that You're, he's mirroring, you know, like understanding that that is interrelations of human beings. I think that when people like slow down and, you know, it's like one partner sitting on the other partner's lap or however that goes in, in multiples of like having a, a breathing practice, co-regulating your heart rate and like really sitting with it. Like, what are we all rushing towards orgasm for? Like, let's, there's so much joy in the journey of that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then it's like time to slow down right? It's like, there's so much joy in the journey of the process of getting to know your partner's body and getting to know your own body and really understanding what like mm -hmm. heightened orgasm can be like. And, you know, you, people will talk about Tantra, you know, in, in a number of different ways, but just, you can use the breath to be able to control a lot of things. And that includes lengthening your, you know, the, 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 the pleasure that you're having with your partner or like, you know, sitting with your partner and just breathing together with nothing on in an intimate space, it's like really about connection, especially if you're like have a kid at home or a newborn or you're like, you know, and you can, you, you just hardly can find the time, what time you have to make it really interconnected, breathing together and being together can be a heightened experience, you know? And then there's quirky other little things as a biohacker. I always build into sort of the, the sex realm, which is just like, I talk a lot, my partner and I talk a lot and sort of spread the word a lot about what we think is like the male enhancement stack and like there's like red light therapy, intravaginal devices. And, you know, you can go down a rabbit hole for sure. Um, but just like yeah. bringing things into the relationship and into everybody's level of confidence in the, in the bedroom uh, or wherever you're having sex, uh, that, that helps, helps you feel like you really are in touch with what's going on. And, and I'm sure that you have this with your with your wife, but it's, it's, it's communication is everything like enough about people sitting around being like, I really wish my partner would do this thing. I, I saw a post on Instagram, which I hate to like refer to Instagram, but <laughs> it's, you know, a landscape. And I saw a post where a woman was like complaining about like, finally, she's like saying, I finally left my husband after 25 years. That man never gave me an orgasm once. And you know what? I don't feel bad for the man. I feel like you spent 25 years with a man. You never opened your mouth to say, here's what I like in the bedroom, like tie me up or don't, or I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, right. touch me this way. Like what's wrong, mm -hmm. not what's wrong with you. Like, I don't want to be judgment judgy, but I want to say, we got to speak up and say, this is what I like. This is what I'm into. Yeah. Like we'll all be so much happier for having more, more orgasms or just better experiences of sensuality and sexuality in, in the world. It's like so crazy mm, to me yeah. that people don't talk about it enough. And a good lover, you know, and maybe, okay, let's just start with, I mean, a good lover will want to hear how their partner wants to be touched and wants to be pleasured. And let's just assume that somebody doesn't have a good partner and they 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 think that the orgasm is the goal. Well, that's a problem, right? Because we you, we, you think that the, you know, essentially you're going, oh, if I get here, then that's successful sex. And it's like, it's very yeah. goal, goal oriented. It's very like, I don't know, Western in many ways, isn't it? It's like, as long yeah. as I get there, get the goal, all good. You know, as long as I get a million dollars, I'll be all good. Even though your family's in tatters, you know, yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the journey. It's the journey up the hill. That's always going to be the joyous bit. The orgasm is just the cherry on the top. And, right. you know, I think, yeah, people need to, maybe figure out how to be better lovers, you know, um, and listening. And some people just don't know. I don't even step. think they're like good or mm. bad lovers maybe, right? They just don't know to ask or they think, 
well, the woman says she's like, a, she's in this space where she's like about to have a big release. And like, I'm just going to like speed up like a jackhammer and like, it's going to make it better. And like, not to say that some women right. aren't into that. Right. I can't be every person in the world, every, every lover in the world, but it's like, just it doesn't like work feeling you, though, into but... that. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> whatever. It doesn't work with me. But no, I just, I interviewed a woman, uh, interviewed a dominatrix on my podcast and people were like, how is that oh, biohacking? Cool. And I called it biohacking BDSM because it was like helping people process all these traumas by wanting to experiment in different ways that maybe their partner wouldn't even experiment with. It didn't necessarily mm. mean that she was having penetrative sex or like sex work in that way. And it's really, and she worked with some couples that were also like, I don't really know how to breach this subject, right? Like I, I make a joke. I'm always like, my mom's listening to every episode. I make a joke. Like, what are you going to be like? Hey, pass the potatoes. Uh, do you want to get a butt plug? Like, you know what I mean? You can't, <laughs> sometimes you just can't, you know, add the, add the, add that into the mix. So you need a little like coaching or help or whatever, but there's so many things that I have another, I have a friend of mine, Alexa, who works in sort of like interrelations with couples. And it's like, some people will be like, that one thing is just so far out there. Like, I'm just so not into that. I'd never go there, et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, it's amazing what you see that actually that thing, that act, that sex act or that toy or that whatever it might be is actually just, it's like sitting right, it's sitting right next to you on the couch. It's like not actually 10 miles away. It just could be, and maybe you won't like it, but it's, it's, it's closer than you think. And it's less weird and it's less, you know, there's the reality is it's like, we need to be inclusive and people who feel like they want to try new things. Somehow we have to find ways or coaches to be able to broach that with our partners. And I think that's communication is key, right? It's like, cool. There could be some cool kink out there that like, what happens if your partner's super into it, but they don't want to bring yeah. it up either. You're missing all these years of like, you know, cross-dressing and tying each other up or whatever. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I want to, we don't have long, but I really want to get out of you how you can breathe with your partner for better sex. Okay, great. Um, I think, we want to stay in a parasympathetic state, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially as we get like closer to orgasm. Um, and that just, a lot of times that's about like down regulating and slowing down the breath, even just like what you're saying you were practicing like earlier, like that long nasal exhale. That's like a bit longer than your inhale and slowing down the connection. It's like lengthening the space before, maybe the final release comes or it's like heightening the experience for both partners. If you feel nervous to sort of like try that in the middle of the act with someone, then you can always practice on your own first to see about like how breathing more slowly and parasympathetically can lengthen or he heighten the experience and lengthen the time mm -hmm. to orgasm, right? As opposed to what I think, I don't know if this is really true, but I can say it because it's you as opposed to like, I think sometimes men have like some like default thought. Tell me if I'm wrong here. Cause I'm so curious, <laughs> a default thought yes. that like, they're like, Oh, I might have an orgasm. So I'm going to think about this other thing. That's like kind of a turn off to make myself yeah. not go there just yet. Is that real? Is yeah, that a dead thing? puppies. Dead puppies. It's a real <laughs> yeah. thing. Like your mom, I it's, don't know. It's, it's like terrible advice that somebody gave us once upon a time. And again, it spread throughout all of mankind. I mean, all of men everywhere heard about this thing that if you uh, just, you can't last very long, think of dead puppies or your, your aunt Mavis or something. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's not really, true. It's Maybe like connecting to breath. Slowing and, down the breath. And then some of it mm -hmm. is like, you can do like breath holding too, which I, I sort of feel like is, and I mean this differently for those of you who are very active and all um, very into a lot of different styles of kink. When I say breath holding, it's very different than breath play, which is a different thing. That's sort of like um, your partner helping you hold your breath in a way that is consensual and safe. But um, so that's more mm. like a, like uh, asphyxiation as a turn on. Ugh, I don't even want to go there, but Got you know it. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so um, <laughs> breath holding can be, <laughs> we, I came to talk about cold and now we're talking about sex. And that's great. We, we've it talked about like it. That. Yeah. And You're so, but I think, you know, um, you know, we're, yeah, we're biohacking, we're biohacking sex in ways. So breath holds can be nice too. <laughs> um, gives you a lot of brain focus and really like into the, f f the moment. And again, some breath holding for some people feels a little bit more 
um, heightened than others, but you can hold your breath and it really brings you into the sensation because what you're doing is when you hold your breath a bit, you are oxy helping oxygenate the tissues in the body more. So you're gaining more awareness and more focus, more potential sensation, like feeling of the sensation that's happening. And how nice is that if something good is going on in that moment or something scintillating? You do a little um, sub-maximal breath holds. Um, and then also really interestingly enough, we see a lot that men right after orgasm can do really long breath holds or longer than their normal average. So um, I'm, I'm encouraging you next time that you, you know, get to that space to take one moment to yourself and say, okay, I'm going to do a natural inhale, natural exhale, hold my breath and see, um, wow, that's pretty in, in, intense or insane that that happens. So, yeah, but mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of physical contact, lots of like sitting on laps and breathing together and then also practicing down regulation breath and submaximal breath holds can heighten the experience in a way that doesn't feel like overly technical. Like, okay, three, yeah. two, hold on one more, you know, in a way that feels like, you know, however yeah. your, your sex play goes. And down regulation breaths are exhale longer than the inhale, right? Yeah, thank you for asking for that clarification. Down regulation is just getting ourselves into a parasympathetic state. So the two nervous system states, sympathetic is like fight and flight. We talk about that, sometimes freeze. Parasympathetic is rest, digest, socialize, and have sex. So those in that whole parasympathetic state is when we want to be in like a more calm state. That doesn't mean sleepy. And the easiest way to talk about it is 2x breathing. So if you inhale for two, you exhale for four, inhale for four, exhale for eight. It's really about like yeah. slowing it down, right? Which is like what I will yeah. say to men if they're asking me about how, uh, you know, how to heighten a woman's experience, which is when you feel like things are getting um, stimulated, excited, all the things, it's time to slow down just a little bit because if you slow down, if you shift your exhale, if you have the woman breathe with you, Again, like I'm in a heterosexual relationship right now. So like that's what works for me. And um, mm -hmm. your partner may be breathing with you. Then it's like heightening sensation because you're essentially oxygenating the system in a really good way. So, yeah. I bloody love it. Kristen, what a, um, what a very <laughs> delicious conversation. Um, and we ended in a great spot. I'm so glad we ended right there too. I, wouldn't, I don't want to go any further. So tell us, Perfect. how can we keep in contact with you? It's great. You can contact me, uh, Sherpa Breath and Cold is where all the breath and cold is. And that's where I do community sessions. I run instructor trainings for coaches who want to learn more about cold and breath and uh, mm -hmm. work with some athletes and stuff in their training bout. Warrior Woman Mode is my Instagram handle, which you were stalking earlier, I saw. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot about women's health there, but also just all the fun biohacks. I really try to have the balance of alpha female and you know sensitive sex talks there so um yeah. yeah people can follow me on those two places and find everything else i'm doing i'm doing there and then your your website is sherpa breath and cold and i have warrior woman mode dot com as well um, and, and if com. people want to listen to my podcast it's certainly not as um exciting and wild and fun and playful well sometimes it is as, as they excuse get to listen me to you just had a dominatrix on <laughs> i just, just actually that's true on, i think not you. I got to yeah, give myself on. more credit. See, there I go doing the thing. I'm like getting, making myself smaller. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah no, so it's, it's fun. So well, well power podcast is where people can find me. Uh, if they want to listen to me interview. Yeah. Dominatrixies. <laughs> and Damn, everyone I'm gonna else listen is there. To that. Cool. <laughs> well, mistress Natalie King, that's the woman I interviewed. She's excellent. Uh, kinky coach. Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, Kristen, thanks so much for joining us here on the Zaddy Zone. God, it's an honor. I've been on a lot of podcasts, Luke. Let me tell you, this is like top form. <laughs> Super stoked to talk oh. to you because it's like easy. You're, you make it easy. You always make it easy to talk. And I feel like that's a oh, uh, quality that doesn't come with a lot of hosts. So keep rocking it. And um, we'll see each other at the next conference or LA or something. I hope so. Thanks, Kristen. Oh, you're welcome. Beauty.